All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another React Wednesdays. We've got a special one for you today. So I'm TJ Van Toll. I work as a developer advocate at Progress, working on the Kenda React team, which is what we're going to be chatting about today. And with me, as always, Dan Wilson. Dan, how are you doing? Hey, hey, we're doing good. It's 37 and rainy, just my kind of weather. Oh, you know, I'm Dan Wilson. I work with uh, Digital Primates, and we do Enterprise React stuff. And we also curate the Enterprise React newsletter. So if you don't get enough emails in your inbox, go ahead and sign up. We'll never spam you. Awesome. Looks like Ivana is joining us today. Hey, Ivana. Looks like we have the YouTube comments working. So that's, that's good to see as well. So we're going to be talking about Kendo React today, which, Dan, what, what do you know about Kendo React? Well, I believe it is a series of 70 plus components built from the ground up for the React library. And it encompasses great components like grids and data visualization capabilities. Um, I understand there's a scheduler that people are super happy of. In fact, I used to do booth duty at conferences and people would come up and thank me for Kendo, which they did often. It would be for the grid or the scheduler, because apparently those are hard UI problems that are solved for you right out of the box. Yep. So, heck, you could, you're going to be, our, you should be our marketer. Although we're up to, it's 80 plus components now. 80 so components. So, you got you to gotta update all your material. Get a, I do. Get a different Let me number make a name that. <laughs> I'll cross off the seven, write an eight. Okay. I'm up to, to current standards. So, what are your favorite components, TJ? Oh, man. It's, it's like a, picking a favorite child, right? You, you can't have just one. Actually, we should, uh, let me start by just sharing my screen because we could look at a big list of these things. Just find the right button. There we go. Nice. New, web, new website, by the way, too. I'll also just point out for anybody that's joining in with us today, this is a pretty uh, loose, casual stream. We're going to be talking about Kendo React, but we can really take this any direction that you want to. So. If you have questions about Kendo React, if there's anything you want to see in action, any demos, just any questions, just feel to drop in, uh, leave some comments, let me know, and we'll dive into it. But Dan asked about favorite components. So see, there's the, the 80 plus. And I, I don't know. I, I think it's got to be the grid just because it's the most, um, I guess, the most complete in terms of you think like paging sorting also I, I think the most like real world because i think every big company ever has a handful of these things around because you at some point you have a lot of data and you need to do things with data and the grid's great for that you know i remember years ago in my career I, clients would ask me to basically implement some excel light version in the browser and you know, I would usually do a reasonable good job getting the functionality that they wanted. But I always remember thinking it was just such a pain. Um, I despise the fact that they wanted Excel because the user interface for Excel isn't the best it could be. But, you know, the upshot is that's what people were familiar with and they wanted to see their data and interact with it in that way. You know, later on when I learned about Kendo, I realized for less than 10 hours worth of work, they could have had a way nicer grid. Um, I guess I should be ashamed of myself, but you don't know what you don't know. The The grid has got a lot of capabilities in, in it that, like, for example, that export to Excel thing is something every manager or executive wants because, you know, thank you for showing me the data in your application, but I need to put it in a presentation somewhere or a different report. And so the way to extract this right out of the web page is pretty nice. Yeah, I this one's one of my favorites to show off just because I think it's kind of slick. Because really, you could use the grid as some way of doing stuff with data in the browser in a nicer, because like you said, Excel is not the greatest to work in. So you could do some operations on your data in the browser where it's convenient, but then like spit out an Excel file that you can send to your CTO or your manager or whoever that only works in Excel. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Yeah, Excel is like the JSON for managers, the structured data <laughs> format that they understand and can parse easily. I'm going to have to tweet that out later. Excel is, <laughs> the, Excel is the JSON for managers. Yeah, so, so, so that alone is pretty nice because I think, you know, when I've built capabilities like this before, the, the, the tool would have to be built using some kind of server-side Excel construct. And this is a front-side, client-side grid only, right? 
So there's some Excel magic that's going on here. Yeah. So maybe, um, I mean, what I planned for today, and like I said, again, if you have questions in chat, we could take this in a lot of different directions, but I've got a little demo app over here with just a way of showing a quick handful of the most, some of the more popular Kendo components, just so people can get a sense of what the workflow feels like. So if that makes sense, maybe we could go through a few of these. And then if questions come up or people want to see different components in action, we could ad lib a bit and throw in a little bit of whatever. Sound like a plan? That sounds sounds good to me. I'm just pinging a couple of slacks to see if anybody wants to hop in. Yep, sounds good. All right, so I'm going to start up this app and I'll just walk people around what's sort of in this thing. So um, you get a sense of what's possible and what this app is doing. And so we'll give this a second to start up. And this is basically just a simple uh, create React app, create React app built <laughs> application, which is a mouthful. And essentially, I've got uh, this is going to be like a dashboard. So we're going to pretend we are part of the fictitious Acme Stocks organization. Acme Stock Stocks is some financial company, so they got a lot of financial stuff for some tech funds, some like mutual fund, and they want to show a dashboard with a bunch of data. And the idea, I think what makes Kendo React compelling, at least to me, is that it is really a comprehensive solution, just in terms of having all of these components. Because obviously, you can find there, there are tons of React date pickers. There are tons of React dropdowns. You can find equivalents of most of these, other than maybe some of the more like advanced things like the grids and the schedulers, those are a little less common. Uh, but these, there are components out there. But with Kendo React, you basically have everything. And so the advantage there is that you know these components are going to have similar APIs. They're going to gather. They're going to be themable together. So you don't have to take some random date picker you found on the internet and make it look like a random dropdown you found on the internet and try to make them work together. You know they're just going to work seamlessly because they're all coming from the same place, the same basic suite of components. Yeah, I think that that's actually an interesting point to dive in because, you know, some developers and I was one of them at certain points in my life, you know, the question is how do you convince management that they need to spend money? Yep. And, you know, if you have a date picker and a manager can find and keep in mind managers used to be developers too most of the time and they can find date pickers, like why would you pay for a date picker? But the point you're bringing up about consistent styling, and you know, apart from that, like these components are guaranteed to work with each other because they're sold as part of a, a group. Um, they also have like common functionality, like the ability to localize or internationalize, which may or may not be a, a capability of you know the random component you found on the web, and you know this sort of friction, I suppose, getting everything to work together and ensure that it, it will actually meet the needs of everything. And not only just the ability to have the components working, but you know, guarantee that the intellectual property license is compatible with what you're trying to do. Like these are things that that have to be done if, if you're not getting a suite where these items are taken care of. Yeah. And then th the long term stability of it too, because Again, the random date picker you find on the web works now, but is it going to continue to be supported? If you run into some weird niche problem, you know, you're relying on sort of the goodwill of the author and the community around that to help you out. And so by using a commercial offering, essentially, you have the guarantee that there's going to be a company maintaining this for the future. And that if you run into problems, there's someone you can reach out to for immediate support. You don't need to wade into GitHub issues or Stack Overflow and sort of hope for the, the goodwill of others to help you out. You have like this instant, like almost partnership with who you're working with. And at the end of the day, it's just about time savings, right? Time is money. And if you're able to get up and running faster, you take some of those, those uh, problematic areas that are just the inherent to modern software development out of the way, it, it ends up in at least bigger organizations that need a lot of these components being time and value savings. 
Yeah, it makes sense to let developers be developers and not ask them to also be part-time lawyers and and part-time graphic designers. Like I know for yeah. one, like I was a really good software developer until it came to anything that had to look nice. And then I was absolutely incompetent. And so the ability to kind of out of the box, get something that looks professional was a big jump. And I remember when Bootstrap came around, everything I did was Bootstrap based because you kind of got a reasonable look and feel out of the box. And I wasn't responsible for trying to come up with one because frankly, at night, I don't fear monsters or mass murderers. I fear uh, a blank styles.css that I have to begin filling out in some sensible way. Like that, that's the boogeyman under my bed. I see we have uh, BJ Swick, 33. Good afternoon. We're chatting about kind of React. So if you have any questions, feel free to hop in. But maybe the place we could start is just actually implementing one of these components just so we can see what this sort of workflow looks like. And for this fictitious app, so let's say the first thing we want to do is we've got a mutual fund. And if you look at a mutual fund online, like one thing they often list is a list of like the people, the people who are in charge of like managing the fund and uh, some information about the fund, like how it's performed over the years, that sort of thing. So for my design here, I want to put like some information in a panel on the left hand side of the screen here. And I've already got the, so this doesn't get too monotonous. I've got the the data already coming back in this fund info, but what I don't have is anything here to actually display this data. So the first thing I want to do is tackle actually getting these things over onto the screen. And so just to give you an idea of what the workflow looks like and how this works. So in this case, the component I'm looking for is a panel bar. And I want the demos, so we'll go here. And the first thing you'll need to do, just like any software problem, is actually install the thing. So in this case, it'll be the Kendo React layout package on NPM. And we try to keep the components, because Kendo React does a lot, right? Like a lot, a lot. We don't just, there's not just like one Kendo React package you get from NPM, because we also want to be cognizant of you don't want to ship a multi-megabyte app to your users, because um, chances are, even though there are 80 components in Kendo React, you probably only need um, certain ones here or there, um, probably not every single one. So in this case, it was Kendo React layout package. So you see, I, I have this installed, so you'd have to install that from NPM. The next thing you need is a theme. So there are three themes that ship as part of Kendo and one is material, uh, one that's based off Bootstrap. Bootstrap is still pretty common, the color patterns for that. And then the default theme, which honestly is a horrible name. We need to come up with a better name than default. Like we need some sort of hip ninja name or something for it, but- Named by engineers, I might say. Yeah, probably. So went with default. And I think in this one I have, I think, I, yeah, I have the Bootstrap theme in here just because I thought that color pattern would look pretty well up. Uh, look pretty good for this dashboard. And we could switch that up if people were interested in seeing other ones, but just going with that. And then from there, really, I think the thing I like about Kendo React is that there really any component you want to use, there is a pretty rich set of demos that show real worldy usages of these things. So you'll see the panel bar has got this sort of expand collapse behavior that you can use to uh, accordion style shows things on the screen. And basically, you can view source and just grab the code from here. I mean, one thing I'll commonly do is just copy and paste this stuff. There's even a handy button to do it as a starting point. You can open these things up in stack blitz. So if you want to just start tinkering an example to get it to meet your needs before you get it out over locally, you can open things up in here and start toying it with it there as well. And so for me, um, I've got a basic implementation of this set up, if I can find the, the right thing. So I've already installed the layout package from NPM, and I'm importing the panel bar and the panel bar item. And so what I'm going to do is drop in a little bit of code that brings in the component and could fix the formatting there, and a couple items within it. So in this case, I'm saying I want a panel bar. I want two items. One is going to have the managers of the fund, and the other one is going to have 
some details. I'm saying this first one should be expanded. And I think the, the thing I like about Kender React is these are components that, I, I mean, they're built from the ground up for React. So they work like you'd expect React components to work. So in this case, panel bar, panel bar item, the props work like you'd expect to in a React app. Um, you can extend them. Like in this case, you can just drop whatever you want in an individual item, which I have like this right now. I think I have an implementation that shows these in a little more detail um, with some nicer pictures of people that yeah, I could drop nice in there. Cool. What's that? That is nicer. Although I, I think uh, if you ask Gennady if he really should be a trainee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all right. He's working his way up. <laughs> but I mean, the I, I think what I like about Kendra React is like it's trying to solve the problems you don't want to solve as a developer. Like, so the part, if I'm thinking about building a panel bar, chances are what I'm going to throw in the thing is going to be specific to my app because mm -hmm. I have something specific in mind here. So this stuff is all custom. But the thing I don't want to code or deal with is like, what is the underlying widget going to look like? Is it going to match the rest of the colors in my app? Doing the expanding and the collapsing. All doing the sense and such. Yeah, doing the accessibility, right? Like um, that's the thing no developer ever kind of want, very few developers want, but it's also very important. So like doing expanding and collapsing from an accessibility perspective is a lot harder than it seems to get, you, you know, this needs to be focusable, the keyboard shortcuts need to work with it, um, those sorts of things. And so having that available out of the box is kind of important as well. And so the, the person implementing just needs to know there's a panel bar that takes children that can take some some parameters or some attributes, and then you just sort of fill in your own content using what looks like regular HTML. Yep. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, that's all that's going on here. This is just panel bar, panel bar item. The same is true. Like, we'll, we'll look at a few other components here in a second. But this uh, up here, this is the Kendra React drawer. And the implementation is kind of the same. If we go up here to just look at the drawer, um, essentially, you provide a drawer and some properties in terms of how it should work. You know, where it's how the animations should work, what should happen when you click on it, then you provide some content, what should be in the drawer. And essentially you're letting the the with the components, you're letting Kendra React take care of the hard stuff, like where what this drawer should look like, where it should behave, but you still have total control over the part that's specific to your app. Mm -hmm. Like where where is the um, stuff in the drawer going to go? Where is the stuff in your app going to go? So it's about finding that balance. Uh, yeah, and from my perspective, like implementing this drawer content and drawer capability like from scratch, that's intimidating. And I have no idea how long that would take, but it would take longer than I'd want to spend doing it. Filling in my own content here like you've done, especially knowing there are some special class names I can use to kind of divide and whatnot. This feels very achievable. And instead of it taking some unknown amount of time to build a drawer, I can just slap one in there and put my content in there in a few minutes and I've got something to work from. So, you know, I feel like this doesn't limit my ability to produce an application, but it keeps me working on the specific parts of my app and not what, what I would consider utility. And Ooh, I'm opening, I'm opening with... have drawers already in them. You should just be able to magically say this. This is oh, one big thing I could go on for hours about. What's the last component was added in a browser? Yeah, no, I could go on a rant about this. And Web Components was supposed to be the solution for this. And that hasn't really Didn't played out. out. Yeah. My, my favorite example, the, the one I always rip on is the list. Because like on iOS and Android, right? if I want to build a really nice list, there's an API built into both those platforms that gives me like infinite scroll, memory management, all this crap. So that that's why the lists that you use on your phone are always like really smooth and really good. Blazing. It's because the platform provides that. Whereas on the web, if you try to th toss like a thousand things in a list, the browser just instantly has no idea. And you need to like either do some 
craziness in terms of virtual scrolling or find a library that helps you do it if you want to build anything that works well on a mobile device. So anyways. The browser is not going to save you, <laughs> folks. You're going to have to implement something to enhance the capabilities of the browser. Yeah, and I, I like, um, I want to get Chad at a few things in here as well. But really, like what you're saying, th that's kind of the essence of what we're trying to do with Kendo React is solving the hard problems while still letting you customize and build the parts that are actually important to you or specific to you. And I think you'll see that more as we get into more advanced examples, because this, I, I like to show something like this first, because this is an example of one of the, the simpler components in the grand scheme of things. But where the, the ability to extend becomes really important is when you get into the really hard crap, like the grid. And so you want to build something really complex, but at the same time, maintain some control over how the thing works, which is a harder challenge, but something that we've tried to solve. Um, so we can look at that in a second, too. You think it'd be reasonable to try to put a grid in here? Um, yeah, we will put a grid in here. And then we only yeah. have 38 minutes, TJ. Are you sure you're not biting off more than you can chew? Oh, we, we've got it. And if you, anybody wants to see anything specific with the grid, we can ad lib and toss in whatever. So yeah, we got a few comments. Primate. Oh man, Dan, you want to take a shot at this? Primate Pete De DeLilio. De uh, yeah, accessibility needs are a big thing for almost public apps. Greatly appreciate the components having ARIA support built in. Yep. Yeah, and it, actually, if we like view source here, and I'll blow up the font size in a second, you'll see. There we go. We can go even bigger. Like certain things, like tab index for the keyboard control and the different ARIA states, sort of automatically get handled for you. Right there's there's nothing in here related to that, so that's just sort of taken care of for you. Yeah, and apart from being a good citizen and just being accessible, there's other types of work where it's required that you build accessible applications. You know, I think many people that have full capability, the ability to see, for example, don't think about how this application might work if you couldn't see. But for people who can't see, like you have an opportunity to, to make their experience like useful or beyond complicated. Um, and, you know, I'm sure everyone on this call would love to be useful if they only knew the right combination of attributes. This is one of those complexities where as a web developer, you just have to either learn it or, or find a library that's implemented it for you. Yeah, and uh, BJ Swix mentions the upload component. Yeah, that's, that's another good one. That... I haven't seen that one. Oh, uh, so upload, we should show that. Uh, do, 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 do. Upload. This is the good old fashioned, like the, so input type file is notoriously. Uh, like select files, plural, yeah. nice. In, import type file is notoriously like the hardest thing in the world to style. Like it's basically impossible. So if you wanna build a custom file upload that looks anyways decent, you have to do some hacks where essentially you're hiding the original input type file, but you're diverting clicks to it. And it's like one of those like classic accidents of how browsers came to be. Yeah, this and, box used to be like that, or it would just like blow right through your Z index and demand it be front and center. Yeah, and it's actually amazing to me because part of me would like to think, I mean, the two of us have been doing web development for a long time. And if you would have asked us 15 years ago, would we still be writing uh, components for doing input type file and select drop down, we would have said like, God, I hope not. Right. But yeah. here we are. <laughs> the browser's not going to save you folks. Nope. So this allows multiple files, uh, for sure. So, um, you're going to show an example of how to use this. I'm curious, what type of backend readiness do you have to have to, to know what to do with these files? Well, this is just gathering them. This isn't actually handling sending things to the server, at least as far, at least in terms of how I've used it so far. It's more just gathering the files from users. So, for example, um, there's different things you can do. Uh, I'm trying to think like this one. Uh, well, we could try uploading something to see how it works. 
So some react SVG drag in a file and then it'll throw up some event that says, Hey, I've got a file to upload and then use the developer handle, pushing that back to the, wherever you want the file to go. Yeah. Essentially once you've got it uploaded, it's basically, yes. Yeah, see in this case, it's got like a, a save and remove. So you, you have to provide like server endpoints for dealing with this. Cause we're, we're just handling the front end for you. So essentially we're documenting what you need to do on the server end of things to actually receive these files. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, awesome, BJ Swick. Yeah, cool. It kind of saved you a bunch of time. That's pretty pretty awesome. If you have any questions you want to see too, just let us know. Uh, and I think you know something I mentioned on one of the broadcasts before that probably bears repeating is in this world that we live in, there are joy jobs and there are no joy jobs. Like no one's ever going to call you and tell you the database is running great. Thanks for all of your efforts. No one's going to call you and tell you the firewall is running great. No one's going to call you and tell you your, your file upload is working great. You know what I mean? Those are expected. The expectation is that they work. And so if you think about what BJ just said, and I really hope this is his experience or her experience, you get to work on the joy parts of the application that kind of don't come out of the box and don't have an expectation of working. And you can focus on solving your business partner or client's true problem instead of dinking around trying to figure out how to make a file uploader work. Yeah, and I think like, I mean, it's taken me a long time to learn this lesson because I think when new developers, your your instinct is that I could do a, a way better job if I built this myself. Mm -hmm. And your instinct sometimes is partially correct because um, lots of times <laughs> if you are, well, it, I mean, truly, if you are building something like custom specific for your use case, you probably can do a better job than some library that ha has to handle the problem generically, but there's a limit to what you can do there because sure, like I could, I'm capable. I've been doing JavaScript for a long time. I could build a date picker for you, Dan. Like I, I could do it, but the amount of time it would take me to do so and to make sure it remains accessible and to make sure it works in all browsers and for me to continue to test on that into the future and to support new feature requests and such, th that's just a lot of time and effort. And chances are, like you said earlier, my business doesn't necessarily care about necessarily having the greatest date picker. That's not the primary function. The, the, getting the date is a means to an end. They don't. And companies these days, are they understand that at certain levels, and they don't want to be a date picker company. They want to be a company that builds apps or that solves problems. They don't want to be responsible for, like I was just talking to our, our good buddy, Dan Skaggs, we've had on, and they've got this, this software they like called Launch Darkly. That's like a feature flag capability. And you can basically release features into production and turn them off and then turn them on. And it's this whole, it's a whole product. Now, I mean, I worked at a company and we built our own feature flag system and it was, you know, we built the first 80% of a feature flag system and then that 80% was all we needed. We never got around to the next 80% because we're not a feature flag company. But the thing is that feature flag software that we built required a certain amount of care and feeding and augmentation. And, you know, we became in essence a feature flag company, right? That wasn't our <laughs> only goal, but that was one of our responsibilities. And like, how many responsibilities do you want to take on? If someone's yep. going to go out and build a house, they don't take an ax and head out in the woods and start chopping down trees to make two by fours. They call Home Depot and get a, a truckload of them sent over. Same thing with shingles. Like you can make your own shingles. Why? Why yeah. would you do that? You know. And I think for software developers who really can build anything, the danger is they'll build anything. But they, you know, with software ends up being like pets a lot of times, where it's it's cute to do it a little bit, but then you realize you have to take care and feed this thing for ten years. Yeah, Ben Bash says it well. Uh, you don't want to be the person that has to explain to your boss why you didn't use a library or framework that's an industry standard. Yeah, because even if you don't like it, at the end of the day, it's just about industry needs and getting the job done. Because shipping whatever you need to ship to move the business is more important than your uh, esoteric views on date pickers. <laughs> that's right. That's it. That's a very good point, Ben Bash official. All right. So, we got an app we should drop in. I, I want to show some charts and I want to show a grid because those Ooh, are some my of the favorites. more common things, right? 
You gotta show charts charts the best. Like, if you add a chart into an application, it immediately becomes enterprise. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then if you add a grid, it's like super enterprise. Oh, yeah. right? like, now you're rocking in the free world. So for this, I've just got some data. Again, I'm not worrying about where this data comes from. This is just a an app for showing some basic stuff, but I don't have any way of displaying it. And so I'm going to drop in just the world's simplest React chart. Now, again, you'd have to install something from NPM. So there is a, let's see what the name of it is. Do to do. Yeah. Kind of React charts, pretty self-explanatory name that you need to install to get the charting library. And we'll just look what this basic thing uh, sort of looks like out of the box. Yeah, there's very minimal attributes here. It's kind of out of the box, like literally out of the box. Yeah, and I mean, it depends on how deep you want to oh, go. Fancy. So, I mean, in this case, we're saying we have a chart, right? Uh, the chart has a title, again, pretty self-explanatory. And then you have a series, which is like a, a series of data and you could have multiple series. So imagine like you had a line chart and you needed to show like multiple lines. Um, you could have multiple series that appears on the chart. But in this case, I've got, basically I'm trying to say, so going into the fictitious mutual fund world, usually you have some collection of how that money is invested. And so I'm gonna show this in a donut chart. I'm pretty sure we can look over, there's, there's like 20 different chart types. And I think some of them you need like a degree in statistics to understand. Right. But like pies and donuts are pretty easy. Actually, we should look just because it should be fun. Uh, do 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 chart react charts. Oh, I want. No, to are more. charts part of the standard package or is that an extra thing? Yeah, it's just part of Kinder React proper. Okay. Ooh, sparklines. You know, it's funny, man. Like people kind of dog sparklines because they're not serious in some ways. But there, there are cases where I need to show like rows of something and sort of a trend of what yeah. we did. And sparklines are A plus for that. It's a great way to show a lot of trend information that just either wouldn't fit in a chart or you don't want to dedicate that much room to a chart. Yeah, no, it's gets it, actually like the first time I saw this, I was shocked that this is actually like a live thing you could interact with because it's like a baby chart. But mm -hmm. I have run across them in the wild sometimes, and they actually can be quite nice, actually, just to toss in a tiny little thing. You can do them in Excel, but it's kind of a pain. And um, I have a feeling the Kendo way is a little easier. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same API. So yeah, here's all the series types. So we mm -hmm. got... I, I, some of these, I still don't know, even though I've been using this for a while. Um, Radar charts are pretty, pretty sweet. You don't, you don't always need those, but if you do, you'd need them. So, you know, you can what imagine. What right even looking like, at, Dan? So there's like two, there's like two lines here, basically. Um, so you can see the, the, the depreciation between 2007 to 2009, like they're, the area inside those lines shrank substantially and so there's less market value and you can see like that comparison in terms of the two areas but you can also see in those axes like who contributed the most into that and so you can see the rbs yeah. bank you're like about 260 270 mil and then it shrank to nothing i guess maybe they went out of business or something horrible happened and so you know, at a glance i can learn a lot about what happened between those two lines that would be much more difficult in a different kind of chart. We need to do a stream where I just go through each of these and you just explain these these things. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I can make up whatever you want, but I actually think radar charts are are not used as much as they could be. So oh, this looks like my portfolio, except mine would have much more red. <laughs> it had a great beginning here, right? They really did. You kind of started off big time. So going back to our example, um, I think like one thing we talked about earlier is the fact that with these complex things, we want to make them sort of s powerful by default and doing some of the hard problems, but still being able to customize because chances are, if you work in a real world company, they're not going to want the default thing that spits out of any of these libraries. They're, they're going to have specific colors in mind, specific fonts, specific behaviors, um, how these things should work. So I got to, couple examples I can show of things you can do. And then we could just look over at the docs to see 
uh, what's available. So for instance, you can put labels on these things and you can mm -hmm. kind of control where they show up. So in this case, I can put them here. There's some option, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but you can make like a little pointer so they stick out. So you can have them like shoot out here. And you could even, um, instead of showing these things in a legend, you could also make them shoot out. So it sort of depends on what you wanna do. You can move the legend around. Um, so in this case, like it, this, again, there's an intelligent default for where this shows up, but I can move this around. I can, there's some other properties in here as well. Um, actually, I don't know if, uh, I don't think for this VS Code is smart enough, but in some cases you can actually get like code complete for what options are available. Actually, I thought that would work. So I might, yeah, I might go back to your date picker example. I think if you surveyed many developers and said, "Hey, you've got to build some charting dashboards," like what's your first move? They would think D3JS, and D3JS is amazingly powerful. But the problem is, you're the one that brings the power. You know, for simple stuff like displaying this chart here, either you're going to find some random Stack Overflow thing and copy paste it and modify it, and then be responsible for modifying it, or you can use something like what you're looking at here, which is literally less than 10 lines of code, you've got a reasonable looking chart. Yep, and hey, AKA, oh man, AKA Doc, we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, we're talking about kind of React, so premium React library UI components. So if you have any questions about the components, feel free to just drop them in. We can take this from here. I've got a little simple demo app that I'm showing off a few components in, but we could take this anywhere we wanna go. And I think the one other thing, I like what you said about D3 too, because D3 is incredibly powerful and you can for sure build any of the things you're seeing here. And I think the reason to use it is A, what you said, just the, the ability to have like these simple APIs for solving it, D3, you can get in the weeds pretty quickly. But I think the bigger thing is just having one consistent place to go for all of this, to have one place to look for documentation, demos, APIs, to have like, I'm not doing anything special in terms of styling and these widgets all kind of look like they work well together because they did come from one place. So you don't have to worry about those sorts of problems as well. And what I just added is, so I added a tool tip. And one thing we do in a lot of our more complex widgets is give these sort of extensibility hooks so we realized that for tooltips, by default, um, actually, I'm curious what happens by default here. If I don't provide anything here and I just say put a tooltip, I think it's going to try to pick out, yeah, like some number, right? But chances are that's not what you want. So we give a hook so that you can just change whatever shows up in this tooltip. So in this case, I want to show the category and not just the actual value. but notice that this gives you the chance to put in any HTML you want. So, I mean, sometimes you'll see tooltips for charts that, I mean, they can be a whole giant thing in and of themselves. So sure. you have some flexibility in terms of what you wanna do. Uh, we do have a question. Um, actually, we have a couple questions. So we can check uh, tag up this one. So AF Shenader, you, you people can laugh at me for my name pronunciations, but- Afshinator? Afshinator, we'll go with that. What set this library apart from others? So in my mind, it's the comprehensiveness of Kendo React, the fact that you have sort of a one-stop shop to get all your components. You don't have to piece around different React components you find from around the web. And I'd say to add to that is some of the more advanced components. So our grid, for example, has hundreds of features. We'll look at the grid here in a minute. So if you stick around, we can start toying with that a little bit. But things like the grid, the scheduler, you can build Gantt charts with Kendo React now, which is kind of crazy and a newer feature. So I, I think it's both the comprehensiveness of the library and some of these more advanced components that you're going to have a hard time finding a free open source React grid that works really well and has a lot of advanced features. So it's um, having advanced components like that as well as part of it. Well, and that may be one of the pieces that we should emphasize a bit more is that these components are polished and they're up to date and they're someone's accountable for fixing bugs and then like that's their day job. That's what they do every day for eight, nine hours a day. 
and there's available support. And I forget how Kendo support works. Can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah. So basically, let me bring up the page so I have a visual aid. Essentially, what you're paying for with Kendo React is access to our support, which basically means if you have an issue, you can create tickets. We you get access to a ticketing system we have. And basically, we're guaranteed to uh, get back with you within 24 hours. So you're using the grid. You hit some sort of bug or something you don't understand. You have a place you can reach out to. You don't have to just uh, put up a random GitHub issue and hope for the best. So essentially, we're more or less kind of partnering with you to help you um, get what you need done in terms of the components that you use. Which gives you control back over your, your deadlines instead of being at the whim of some random open source person who may not see yeah. your issue as important today, or hopefully maybe taking some time off from working on open source stuff. Like you have accountable partners and in, in, in on the Kendo team who would, once again are dedicated to answering your questions. Yep. And Afshinator, it is just React Web. So the components you're building are, are web-based entirely. So no React Native. Uh, did I have a question come in? I have a concern rather than a question. I work within a .NET shop, and they're very keen on Blazor. But the back end guys need to use these kinds of libraries. I feel some of the value I bring on the front end is being able to shape and style things myself. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with Blazor, but I, I do believe you still get the ability to customize these things. Because I know, I mean, at the end of the day, Blazor is spitting out web apps. I know it's through like web assembly and such, but I still think you get some ability to customize these. Although I can't say I know exactly how that works um, just because I'm not super familiar with Blazor. Um, I know that uh, if you're familiar with Kendo UI, the, we're actually rendering the same widgets over in Blazor land as well. But like I said, I'm not super familiar with Blazor. So I can't say I know 100% of where the customization would actually happen. I know the CSS would mostly still work the same, but I have, I, I'm pretty sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the logic would then move to C Sharp instead of JavaScript. I think that's right. Maybe yeah, you and if you go back to your wrong. panel example where you sort of took the panel construct, but then added your own. Yeah. I don't know if you want to call it innards or content or whatever, like, you know, that's pretty approachable HTML. It looks just like HTML, except for these dynamic binding pieces. And it seems like the ask is pretty minimal of, of how to, to, to use and enhance them. Well, I think that gets at in Blazor, because in Blazor, you're doing a lot of your app logic in C Sharp. So I don't know the specifics of that stack where a lot of this logic I've never moves. Been a C -sharp guy. But yeah, if you have any, uh, if you follow up with us afterwards, um, <laughs> yeah, back end guys love these libraries, so it devalues my role. Yeah, I honestly I think there's always gonna be a place for front end people. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, I mean, if if nothing else, like though there's no way you can get around having to use CSS to customize some stuff and back end people, if there's something they really don't like, it's CSS. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I would also say that you know using a library like this would might make the backend developers comfortable because they can sort of avoid having to parse lots of front end language to figure out oh this is really a panel bar, but it should still leave you plenty of room to be creative and skin and style and create extra interactivity without asking you to do too much. So I wonder if there's not a, a fair balance here where maybe your role wouldn't be devalued. You're just working on the parts that are actually more valuable than going back to our date picker example, then rebuilding a date picker. Yeah, I mean, just in general, more stuff is moving to the front end rather than less. So um, even if one, some of your apps move over to Blazor, it's not like the front end world is going anywhere. It's just getting more popular. So I think your skill set is just in general still going to become valuable, if not more valuable over time. You're important, man. You're, you heard it right here on Put It Live. You're important. We value you. Whoever you are, you're important. Exactly. I want to see a uh, grid, man. Yeah, let's do a grid. I think we need to. So 
show me some grids, show me how to download this stuff into Excel and I can make management happy. Right. So same thing. I've got a panel here, call this thing positions. So is basically panel this is like a container, like a user yeah. interface container. Yeah. The idea is, so the way this, this app is architected is if I go in here, dashboard. So uh, I've got basically four panels that make up this app and then I drop things into, and the grid's gonna go in this one down here. And so let's do that. And again, so grid, once again, it's a package, you get it from NPM, kind of react grid. I've got some data already coming in and I'll just put in the world's simplest starting point and then we can go as crazy as we want from there. Well, that's so, less code than using a table. Yeah, and I mean, actually, what's interesting is the grid under the hood is a table. So if I look at this and see this, this mm -hmm. really, you you basically are building a table at the end of the day. And there's all the ARIA stuff in there, so you can move around the table fine. Yeah, and anybody that's worked with raw tables before in the browser knows that they're the absolute worst once you get beyond like this exact point right here, <laughs> like as a developer, you can build this with a table, no problem, right? Like kind of react at this point is doing absolutely nothing for you. However, once you need like any requirement whatsoever from here, that's where browser-based tables are awful. And to get into what we talked about earlier, the browser doesn't try to help you in any way. There's no like, I, I mean, there's no sorting, filtering. Dude, uh, sorting, like, like why is there no sorting in an HTML table out of the box? I cannot possibly understand how in 25 or 30 years that didn't get to the top of someone's priority list. Yeah, I don't know. Sorting, filtering, anything? So I, I don't know. I think at some point the browser, there was a spec related to doing some of these things that went absolutely nowhere. I do know back from my jQuery UI days, there were some specs around allowing styling of form controls too that were sort of in progress, but then they just sort of died out for whatever reason. I don't know if it was just lack of browser interest or just the complexity with it, but. The joys uh, of working in a committee. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things that stands out to my managerial eye is I'd like to see some number formatting here. Yeah, we could definitely do some number formatting. Actually, that's a good segue. So one of the things I've mentioned uh, several times at this point, but we try to provide extensibility points or sort of uh, basically ways of configuring everything you see in the grid. And so in this case, there's not much, but we'll look at, we can look at some demos because obviously the grid can do a whole lot because you could have filters in here. You can have paging controls at the bottom. Uh, there's a lot you can do. But one thing that's built into all of these is there is cells. And so let's say that I've got these change percentages and let's just say I wanted to simply make these either red or green, right? That's like financial apps 101, right? Good. Numbers that go up should be green. Numbers that go down should be red sort of thing. And then we can also format these numbers as well. So one thing I can do is say, all right, so I want to basically control how this cell actually gets rendered. So Kendra React has a default. By default, it's just going to look at this day change property in a JavaScript object. But if I want to override that, if I say like, actually, there's something more specific I want to do here, I can throw in an API. So I can say, I want to create a change cell. And then we can go up here and say, change cell. And this thing gets some props. It's, that's, see, TypeScript's helping me now. I don't know why it was so mean to me earlier. Uh, freezing and lancing. Yeah. So for our change cell, we'll just, let's just get like a pass through working first. So we'll just say hi and see now, instead of taking this property, it basically uh, divvied up or 
delegated, I should, is what I meant to say, the rendering over to this custom thing that we're building here. And actually I should give a shout out to, uh, I don't think I'm supposed to have favorites in terms of frameworks, but React is so good for this sort of thing because it just lets you create these lightweight components so easy. This is like quite literally, what's that five, four or five lines of code to make this happen. And in Angular, you need a lot more uh, ceremony to do this sort of thing. Uh, but React is quite nice for this. Yeah, it's this quite is easy. An interesting example of how you can quickly and easily customize the Kendo grid and be aware of what your customizations are. Yep. Glance. So I have, I saved off an implementation of this earlier that requires a little less typing, but I'm going to spit out the same cell but I'm gonna look at the value that comes in and just say, if this is positive, let me apply a class name, change up, otherwise change down and toss a percent sign after it. And then in CSS, I have class names that make essentially this one green and this one red. Yeah, that's so magic. You get this rendering, uh, this one's also a percent, so we can change this as well. And so, to get that working as well. And you wanted a number formatter as well. So we could do that. Yeah, in the world I live in, all numbers are right justified and they need some appropriate amount of commas. So let, we could build this on the fly. So we have a cell, we wanna call this like a, I don't know, number cell. I like number cell. They say there's two hard problems in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. So if you can Yeah, get exactly. That's why when we talked to earlier about those theme names, I'm kind of surprised the theme name wasn't test one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh so I got my let's just get status quo here. So I have a value. And if I just I always this is like the paranoid developer in me. I always like to see that like get things working just see something on the screen so this should be no change yeah there was an interesting book called the pragmatic programmer i don't know if you remember reading this yeah then there was a chapter in something called tracer bullets which basically can be summed up to don't write an hour's worth of code write like a one minute worth of code and make sure you do something visible that you can validate worked and mm -hmm. and keep kind of trading up works for better functionality versus like I say, working for an hour and hitting save and pushing the button and going, I don't know what's wrong. Yep, and uh, AK, the, the pie chart is Kendo. So everything you see here really is Kendo. So this is a Kendo app bar, a Kendo drawer. This is even a Kendo avatar. So there's a lot of low level things, a Kendo panel bar, Kendo chart, Kendo grid, and the animation is built in. That's That's the default one and it is customizable as well. So there's, you could turn it off if you don't like the animation. I think you can tweak like the duration of the animation. Um, so there's other things you can toy with that as well. Oh, but yes, it's Kendo. AKD cubed. AKD, AKD, AKD. Yeah. I've been working out how to say that for a while. And it's, you know, <laughs> we can get some clarification, AKD cubed. Or if you like the cube thing, we'll just keep rolling with that. Dan got it. <laughs> nice. Winning. You did it. So how do we want to format this? We got a value. Um, so uh, right, uh, right, right align it and mm, put a number format with a mask in there. So we could say like making this up, but I think that's, I would normally do this in CSS, but yeah, there we go. So we got Looking good. You wanted right aligned. And what did you want a mass? Do you want me to like truncate these numbers, make them not huge or? What about just the appropriate commas in the right spot? Oh man. Is that going to become underscore dot JS? Oh man, we, we could do it. We have smart people in the comments. Somebody could probably give us a one liner on how to do that. Um, there is a Kendo number formatter. Oh man, am I gonna learn something new? Kendo React number format. 
Yeah, because there's internationalization built in as well. Yeah, field number. Uh, Kendo dot format. Yeah, See, I'm, I'm in, in the jQuery one. Let me flip over. Yeah, we got to find it in the. So if we look for, how good is our site search? Let's find out, shall we? Number format. I get more and more impressed by how much nonsense I can type in a keyboard and Google can actually figure out what I really mean. Yeah, it's scary at times. <laughs> scary, dude. Now, it accepts number format options. We like number format options. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere in here. We should improve the uh, APIs for this sort of thing, considering I can't find them out of the box. Because some of the widgets, they're built into directly. But the underlying API doesn't appear to be super well documented. It's all right, though. If we can't figure it out. Yeah, because you can get like number formats, for example, for the numeric text box. And this is the sort of thing that's built in, like currency formatting and that sort of thing. But yeah. it's, it's using it under the hoods. And actually, I have the somewhere in here, I've got the internationalization. It's already installed in here and ready to go because some of these, like the date, date picker, yeah. for example, depends on it. It says zero column format. And that offers some choices. What can we import from that package? Let's see. Well, this is actually in grid cell props. Oh, in grid cell props even? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it, I'll put a link here into uh StreamYard. There we are. Now for real this time. It's claiming you can put Put this syntax zero colon format where format is a standard number format. Oh, interesting. So let's we'll let's run these side by side. Colon zero or zero colon zero or zero colon one and see what happens. All right, what happened? <laughs> maybe it doesn't <laughs> um am i doing this wrong format it's a string oh i think it might want uh, okay hold on i think this is like a tj can't parse correctly thing okay so it didn't uh... fail but it didn't do anything Oh, okay. Well, it's not format. You have to format is so I got to bring this over. Format is a standard number format, a custom number format for information and support. Okay, we're getting it. We're going to get this one way or another. Uh, number parsing, right? And we want. Sorry, we'll come back and. Uh... We'll have to have a discuss. We'll have to chat about this, the documentation with the, the React team. Considering I can't figure this out from the documentation. Oh, format in uh, zero colon n zero. <laughs> zero colon n zero like that. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense when you go to their number formatting page. Because... Uh, that didn't work either. Really. So n specifies, it formats the number as a decimal number based on the locale to specify precision at a number after n. By default, the number is formatted and rounded to three decimal digits. 
And so if you wanted, say, commas and uh, five precision points, you would use N5. We can skip this for now because I have a feeling that you're going to have to make like a indirection function and do this. It's not going to just go nuts like this. Figure it out all on its own. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Doc section right there. And the funny part is people on our team probably have to do this all the time because of that big Kendo React app we have. Yep. That shall remain nameless. I don't know. Did you learn something today, Dan? Did you find find this interesting? I am shocked that I can talk to you as you're implementing all this stuff. And you know, the smoke and mirrors part of it or the hand waving part, like this grid. I mean, you really didn't add a lot of code here. You put in like this grid is what, 10 lines of code and it's pretty full featured. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing too is like in the grand scheme of things, chances are your real world grid won't look like this. Chances are it's going to need things like paging, sorting, filtering, that sort of thing. And actually I could show, I did a video. If you're interested in the grid specifically, Act. The grid's the gateway drug, isn't it? Uh, it really is. So I've got a 16-minute video here that you don't have to watch me fumble around with intro to the your React grid. So in this thing, I built end up building. You'll see that I add stuff like oh. paging, sorting. Filtering, that sort of thing. Custom content like those boxes, check boxes and X's. Yeah, exactly. So that's like changing. That's like the custom rendering we, we did. But um, yeah, paging, sorting, filtering. So a little bit more of like what a real world grid would be. But you see that even, right, like even when you get more complex, the code here is still kind of simple, right? You're doing things like pageable equals true, filterable filterable equals true. Um, and then, but you do need a little bit more logic for how you're managing your data, like what happens when the user hits next page, because you need something in there to handle that. So, so if a user, if someone was going to take, say, their first steps with the Kindo React uh, component library, you mentioned before, they just go to the examples and copy the code out. Is that sort of the best way to get something started that you can begin playing with? So step one, what I would say is if you go to the Kendo React homepage, there's a get started link up here. And this would be the first thing that I would do just because it has you just, it's a, it's a really simple tutorial. It's just gonna have you drop in a handful of components, but it's gonna teach you just some of the basics that you're gonna need to set some background in terms of where do you find the components? How do you set up a theme? How do you build something? really simple. And then once you have that down, really like if you know a bit of React, then you kind of already know what you need to know. There's, I, I think that's one of the real advantages of the library is that these components are not all that hard. Like, so like once you do have those basics from this get started link, you kind of can just jump into one of these things, look at what they're doing. Yeah, like the editor, this one, don't talk about a whole lot, but this is right. Like this is the sort of thing that's like almost impossible to build on your own. But yeah, we used to use this thing called the FCK editor. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah. CK editor. It's still around. I believe. This looks like it's all client side though. This is all client side. Yeah. And I think the trick with this is, you know, people would think, wow, well, I could make this Well, you can, but the problem is, you know, you're putting, HTML inside of a text area, which, you know, it has to be correctly um, escaped in order to not blow up your HTML on the page. And so, you know, underneath the waterline, there's some complexity in building one of these that you don't have to deal with if you use one that's already kind of working. Yep. And you can export these things as well somewhere in here. Actually, we just did some way of doing like, I think this like inserting images. There's something we just added in the latest release. I, I think it was like importing local images. Yeah, so there's some code in here. Like if you wanted to build one of these editors in like GitHub style, you wanted to be able to like drag in images or place them in here. 
Uh, let's toss the chicken in here. <laughs> As one does. Yeah, As one like does. Way better. Yeah. Um, like I said so, earlier, whenever I got thanked for Kendo, it was the grid and the scheduler. We haven't talked about the scheduler at all. Can we take two minutes and kind of go through that real quick? Just from yeah. the doc perspective. I like AKD. Yeah, text editor is interesting. Never tackle that on my own unless I have a <laughs> two-year two deadline. So yeah, it's exactly. Not me then. Oh, man. And, and even like some of the stuff going on into the hood in here is kind of nuts. I, what's kind of nice about Kendo is... The Kendo React components are all built from the ground up with React. But for some of these really, really complex mm -hmm. widgets, we're sharing some of the like underlying guts with these components we've been working on for a long time at Telerik. So Kendo UI has been around for, I mean, nearly a decade at this point. So some of these implementations that we have, like we've put a nice React API around it, but the guts is something complicated that's been around and we've been iterating on for a very long time because some of these are really hard problems to solve in the browser. Yeah, like a localized calendar is a nightmare. Yeah, so the scheduler is um, basically like you're building Outlook's calendar interface, but just in the browser. And actually, so there's a lot of cool stuff here, but. I think my favorite is just because we've been talking about this a lot is in terms of customizing these things. So we have if the customization section here, like if you want the ability to customize like how individual calendar items look, like maybe you need to show certain icons on here, depending on the type of meeting, you have control over that. There are extensibility APIs for this section on the bottom, on the top, you can make them disappear. You can take the current implementation and like build on top of it. You can build your own UI. There's even uh, there's an agenda view for some of these. Um, I swear, like I've been using this for a while, and sometimes I find features that I didn't even realize existed. Like you can take a view of this um, a normal calendar and show it in terms of just like this is your agenda for the day and that's built into the control as well so there's really a lot of cool stuff in there yeah once again the kind of thing that you know a developer should not spend their time doing and i don't know of a a, a react scheduler that's out there there's pro probably some that are out there but it's not a common control people offer you know as their pet open source project yeah, and Snowcrest the text editor is great. I just want some syntax formatting detection for code editing within the editor. Yeah, I don't know if um, I don't think because the the intention behind the editor is more of almost like your. I mean, you you can use the editor in multiple different ways, but it's almost for like a CMS sort of thing. Like I'm going to drop in and let my users customize the text for whatever in like a lot of different ways. Or a web page or an alert somewhere. Yeah, email is like a good one. Like if you're building a thing and users need to like create a email that your system is gonna send out on a schedule or something like that, then you could provide this editor as a way of customizing it. So it's not really intended for things like code highlighting in particular. I mean, I'll, so it's not gonna do that automatically. You could do some of it, right? Like you could have, um, a way of having code format in here. There are also extensibility points uh, built into this as well. So you can build your own buttons for this. So if you have something specific in mind, you can do that also. So. Very helpful. Well, cool. I think, so we covered getting started a little bit. Um, up here is probably the best place to start. Does anybody have any final questions before we wrap up? And I will mention too, that this is gonna be our last React Wednesday of the year. So we will be back after the holidays. If you have some good shows coming up in the new year. So we're gonna have Jamie Birch on and Nathan Walker from the NativeScript team to talk about React NativeScript. So those guys are pretty cool. That should be a lot of fun. And we have Eve Porcello coming on the week after that to teach Dan and I about GraphQL because we don't know GraphQL very well. <laughs> we don't know graphql -o. And then th I think the week after that, we've got Tyler McGinnis coming on as well, which should be it's pretty fun. January. Yep. So 
should be some fun times. Um, yeah, and as always, if anyone in the comments or or whatever has show ideas or things they'd like to see, we're you know we're here for you. So let us know what things are of interest, and we'll wrangle and cajole and get those folks on and talk about what you want to hear. Yep, and Snow Crash. Yep, perfect for rich text editing. You have to just put the bow on it. Yeah, you can dig into it, but it's it will be a little bit of grunt work, but it can be fun too. It's gonna be a fun holiday experiment, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Been using Kendo since twenty twelve. It's awesome to hear. That's um, how far are we going back? Way back. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, this has been fun. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Like I said, React Wednesdays. We're here every Wednesday, but we are taking holidays off. So back first week of January. So come check us out. Let's have some fun. Adios, folks. All right. Thanks, Dan. See you, everybody.